Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's. Uh, uh, so what I'm um, what I'm planning uh, here today is um, first I will talk briefly about Kelly Ricard, her um, where she's from and her you know um, life in general. Then uh, we go on to you know each film by film in probably in a chronological order. Then come back to. Uh, the major themes that uh, you know, kind of uniting all those um, films or her entire body of work. So, Kelly Reichardt was born in Miami. Um, she grew up in Miami, and uh, Miami, you know, it's a um, it's it's a southeast corner of the United States. And uh, her first film, uh, River of River of Grass, is uh, short and set around the Everglades. Uh, National Park region, which is like uh, 30 minutes to one hour from Miami. So it's kind of closer to Miami. And that story takes place in a, in, in a location that is very familiar to um, Kelly Raycott uh, from, you know, because she grew up in that area. Then uh, right now she is a professor at the Bard College, uh, which is in Northeast, um, about an hour to an hour and a half from New York City, north of New York City. And um, after River of Grass, which came out in 1994, uh, she had a long time, or a, you know, like a 12 year gap um, between her next uh, feature film, uh, Old Joy, which came out in 2006. So 1994 to 2006, she made uh, two or three short films in that. Uh, one of them is about an hour long, uh, not very widely distributed. Uh, she had a trouble finding work after her first film. So it, it was a you know, 12 year long a struggle to find um, you know, her next film. Um, then Old Joy came out. It's a you know, very low budget um, film, independent film, you could say. And um, it was released and uh, it kind of caught the attention, uh, especially uh, festival goers. Then afterwards, all her films are set in and around Oregon, um, except for certain women, uh, which was set in Montana, again, Mountain West, um, you know, Pacific Northwest, which is the um, you know, geometrically opposite corner of Miami, where she, she grew up. You know, Miami is in uh, Southeast, uh, warm uh, climate, warm, hot, or more, more like a tropical climate. Um, the, the Pacific Northwest is the geometrical opposite, uh, which is or the uh, west north corner of the United States. That's where all her films are uh, set, except for the first one, uh, River of Grass. River of Grass. Uh, so uh, she doesn't live in Oregon or the uh, Pacific Northwest. She lives in the east, east Coast. So she travels back and forth the entire country driving uh, in order to look for locations and meet with the people. So that's, you know, when she's not teaching, that's her general way of life. And she, she had a dog she, and she was very fond of her dog. And the dog is Lucy in Wendy and Lucy. Lucy is her dog. And the same dog appears in Old Joy. Um, and also the film Certain Woman is dedicated to Lucy. Um, I think uh, she probably passed away by that time. So because of this dog, um, uh, Kelly Raycard couldn't fly, you know, couldn't take a flight from East Coast to the West Coast. So she usually drives with her dog uh, as her companion. So that's, you know, uh, uh, this is the general idea, you know, kind of giving you an idea, you know, what she is as a person. And now, uh, you know, starting with uh, River of Grass, which came out in 1994, a very low budget film. Um, it's about a woman um, kind of trapped in between circumstances and she wants to get into a better place and she falls for a, a guy. Then there is, you know, a little bit of a crime, um, misadventure with the, uh, with the law. Uh, then they're trying to escape that city, but they're unable to escape the city. So they're kind of trapped in the place and they, they, they want to go to a better place, but, you know, ca cannot do that. And it's kind of uh, a Bonnie and Clyde aspect to that film. 
and it is very tied to that loc specific location you know the everglades and um, you know the southern florida um, that that the story is very specific to that location and this is something we see all over kelly raycard's work uh, each and every film is unique to, you know it cannot be imagined in another location for example if you take old joy it cannot be imagined in another um, state or, or you know certain woman or any of her um, movies are you know, kind of closely related to their setting or the in, in the location uh, the the place where the story is set so it cannot be set in California or New Mexico or you know some place like that it's very um, you know kind of um, there, there is a very intricate relationship with the location now uh, the old joy old joy comes after um, 12 years after river of grass it comes out in 2006 after iraq war and you know um, uh, bush uh, george bush do george w bush's presidency coming to an end in like two years and that um, period of time uh, just before the economic collapse and um, the the, the political undertones are kind of hinted in the film, uh, but not very obvious when uh, these two guys, the, it's about two guys uh, kind of trying to rekindle their friendship and they're driving to a, a remote wilderness area um, to kind of, you know, talk with each other and kind of rekindle their uh, relationship. Um, and uh, so that, that it, it's kind of a road movie. Um, well, it's not exactly on the road, but it's more like, you know, they're traveling throughout the movie and they, 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 they reach a, a remote wilderness area and they talk over and uh, there is a reverse Pekinpa aspect to uh, Old Joy, you know, Pekinpa films. Um, it's mostly about um, exploring male violence and finding the tenderness embedded within male violence. So that's mostly Sam Pekinpa movies. So this is in reverse. So in Old Joy, uh, we see male tenderness ending up in male violence. So exploring tenderness uh, or exploring tenderness in relationship ending up with uh, male violence. So kind of a reverse Pekinpa. And also, you know, the, the backstory is interesting uh, because, you know, Kelly couldn't work for like 12 years. Uh, she couldn't make a film for 12 years. So she uh, read this uh, short story by John Raymond. Then she emailed John Raymond, uh, do you have any other interesting story that I could adapt, uh, which is set outdoors because I don't have money to afford for lighting. You know, if, if a film is set in interiors, you need a... Um, you know, um, lighting setup, and she didn't have money for all that. So she wanted a story that can be shot outdoors with the natural light. And also she could write her dog into the story uh, because she cannot, you know, leave the dog behind. Uh, she, she cannot uh, leave the dog, dog alone at home. She, you know, she has to take her dog along with her when she's making the flip. So um, John Raymond told her this is a, you know, there is a story and uh, she reads Old Joy and uh, she rewrites the script along with the John Raymond. And uh, that movie, I mean, that story is set, you know, almost uh, uh, the entire movie is set outdoors, uh, shot in natural light with a very low budget. And the, the, she wrote her own dog into the story. So the dog goes with these two people. So that's, you know, kind of interesting thing. Um, again, uh, the relationship to animal is kind of very central to almost every film. Um, uh, in uh, in Old Joy and Wendy and Lucy, there is you know there is a dog, and Wendy and Lucy Lucy comes up in the title itself. So d d Lucy is the com uh, companion for Wendy. So Wendy is trying to go to Alaska, uh, where she is hoping to find a job. So she has a car, but her car breaks down. Uh, again, it's kind of a road movie, but you know, it's not like, like a typical road movie, but she's moving or she's trying to move or, you know, it's more like a, she is trying to find, um, she into, she's trying to find an opportunity to seek a better opportunity. You know, it's a, you know, pre-opportunity kind of idea. 
So she hopes if she gets into Alaska, she may be able to find uh, a job of her liking and she can you know, build a life there. But in order to go there, she has to have a car and you know, gas money and you know, money for expenses. And, and somehow this person is outside the system. We don't know about her family or she doesn't have much friends or anyone. Uh, and she's kind of alone in, the, in this world, uh, except for the dog. And um, um, as you know, the story goes on, it goes to devastating climax and very you know, uh, emotionally um, devastating um, uh, culmination to the story of Wendy and Lucy. And again, uh, the idea that is that uh, Kelly has built in River of Grass um, and also in Old Joy uh, continues through Wendy and Lucy that characters are uh, kind of trapped in their atmosphere or, you know, the, the, the location they are, the physical location or the circumstances. Uh, so these characters are trapped in their circumstances and the location they're trying to escape or go to a better place, go to a better life. That's, you know, their, their, their eventual plan and ambition, but, um, you know, somehow they are not able to uh, achieve that. Somehow they are not able to get to that place, uh, that better life they are dreaming for or hoping for. So, you know, again, that goal is not well defined. Uh, it, it's like a very, amal, you know, very, very, very amalgus um, um, idea that, you know, going to Alaska might, she might get a better job and she doesn't have the exact plan that what she's going to do. Or, or in old joy, uh, these two people are going to wilderness um, kind of to escape their own normal family life to rekindle a friendship so that, you know, they can have a more open, um, you know, body relationship with another man. And, um, but somehow they are not able to achieve that. So the, the, the goals are not very well set, but somehow they're trying to escape or move to a better situation, life situation for them. Emotionally, um, you know, or, you know, in terms of, you know, or, or financially or, you know, emotionally. So in terms of Wendy and Lucy, it's more, you know, financial, in terms of old joy, it's more emotional. And um, coming to her next film uh, that came out in 2000, Wendy and Lucy came out in 2008, then Meek's Cutoff came out in 2010. So Meek's Cutoff is probably her first period movie. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a strange Western sort of. So it is set in 1845. So um, Kelly Raycott, as a person who reads a lot of history and, um, you know, this um, old journals from frontier men, and she came across a real incident that happened in Oregon in, in 1845. So a group of people who are going to Willamette Valley in, in Washington, Oregon area, uh, in the Pacific Northwest. So they're traveling from the East uh, and uh, they are led by a person called Stephen Meek. So it's a large group of people, like thousand people and about 150 wagons. It's a, it's a very big group. And the Stephen Meek is the person who is leading them and he convinces them that uh, he will take them to the Willamette Valley where, you know, kind of like um, the, the, the promised land or the paradise. So these people are looking for a better place. So they're trapped in this, you know, not so likable surroundings or situation or, you know, landscape. So these people are traveling through mountain desert, uh, desert and uh, crossing the Oregon and reaching the West Coast. So um, Oregon and Washington State, if you look at, um, there's the Cascade Mount, Mountains. Uh, so on the West Coast, there is the Pacific Ocean. Uh, then a um, little farther from the West Coast, there is a mountain range parallel to the coast uh, going, you know, running northwest, uh, sorry, running north-south, so, uh, the Cascade Mountain region. So the, the all the rain and the moisture coming from the ocean is kind of uh, stuck at that region. And to the west of the mountain range is, um, you know, rich with the vegetation, trees, um, animals, everything. And uh, the east of that region doesn't get much rain and it's 
entirely dry and uh, um, not many trees, just grasslands and um, uh, practically a desert. So it has this, uh, you know, these two states, Washington and Oregon has this, uh, you know, about one fourth of their region to the west is, you know, rainforests and a lot of vegetation and a lot of trees. And the, uh, the three, uh, almost three fourths of the east side is a barren landscape with no vegetation. It's a, practically a desert. So these people are trying to reach the valley where, which is the promised land. The, the, that's the story in Meeks Cutoff. So Meeks Cutoff is a real trail in Oregon. Um, and uh, the, 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 the guy who is leading them, Stephen Meek, he doesn't have a clear idea what he's doing. So he is, is the, you know, the ignorant, pompous guy who's guiding, you know, kind of misguiding people Either he is trying to um, you know, swindle them by, you know, uh, by leading them to some place and take their money, getting paid for it, uh, or he doesn't know that he doesn't know it, or he is willingly evil. So we, we don't know which one he is. So this is the story we, uh, you know, Kelly is adapting, and that makes cut off movie and. Uh, uh, of course, the size is very small. Instead of thousand people, it's more or like uh, eight or ten people, including children. So it's uh, mostly three families, uh, uh, three men, their wives, so three women, and uh, Stephen Meek, and one of the family has children. So that's that's it mostly. So they have three wagons, one for each family. So they're traveling through this uh, desert landscape, and Stephen Meek is kind of leading them, but he doesn't know where he is leading them. Uh, so uh, the, the the movie, if you if you kind of try to summarize, makes cut off. Pretty much nothing happens throughout the movie. Um, that's you know kind of the interesting thing. So they 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 go on and they capture an Indian. Indian means you know Native American, um, a person and uh, who speaks some other language and, and they have no means of communicating to them. And uh, this wagon, you know, this group of people traveling, their water is about to go away. I mean, they, they have very short supply of water. They reach a water body, but it is alkaline, so it, they cannot drink it. Their animals are about to die. Uh, again, you know, the idea of animals, they have horses and oxen. The oxen pulling the cart and you know, horses. So there, there's a symbiotic relationship between humans and animals in this story too. Um, like, you know, just like in Wendy and Lucy or in you know, Old Joy, there is a, relation, a human animal relationship built into the story. That's very uh, kind of integral part of this mixed cut of narrative. Then they, uh, they, they, they're capturing the Indian and the, the Stephen Meek, the, the person who leads them says, you know, he must be killed at the, you know, the very moment because he's not trustable, he's not reliable. Um, his people are violent, so we cannot trust them. We have to, you know, they're barbaric. They're not cultured, they're not civilized. We have to kill them. That's his argument. Then um, uh, the, the women and their husbands kind of, you know, think the other direction because, you know, they want to get to water. Uh, so in order to save themselves. And then you know, Stephen Mink is not able to help them. So they are thinking probably if they can, you know, if the Indian person can help them to reach a you know drinking water supply they can save save themselves so that is the idea so uh, so they try to um, you know they are suggest not to kill him but take him as a captive and keep him uh, so that you know they he will eventually lead him to you know lead them to a water source so they keeps him and um, the main character is played by Michelle Williams, who is also in uh, Wendy and Lucy. Uh, central character Wendy is played by Michelle Williams. Uh, in this movie, uh, it's uh, Emily Tatterton um, or something. Um, I forgot the exact name. So uh, the main the main woman character is also played by uh, Michelle Williams, and and um, she is helping the Indian guy, uh, giving him a blanket. Then. Uh, uh, he, uh, she repairs uh, his broken boot. It's like a, a leather boot and she re uh, repairs it. It's kind of torn. So she repairs it. 
and she gives him food. So the idea is she's trying to make him feel that he owes her something. Okay, so she is helping him so that he will feel he owes her something and he will help them. Okay, that's the idea. That's how their mind works. And and giving the while giving the blanket, um, it is kind of hindered that you know it's the barter system. They are he uh, you know they are helping him so that he will help them. That's the idea. Uh, and um, uh, the, the 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 Indian person um, he is credited as the Indian and nothing else. Uh, and no name or anything else is given. Uh, because we don't know what language he speaks, even though he speaks a lot in the movie, and uh, the, uh, his dialogues are not subtitled, because the language he speaks is not understood by the people in the gang, right? So he speaks a lot, and um, um, I happen to read, or you know, more on this movie and uh, um, a, a, a script of this movie, and what he is actually speaking. Um, there is a sequence in which he's talking to the moon, okay? Um, so the, the Indian guy, they're speaking to the moon, and what he is actually speaking is, he's talking to the moon saying, um, he doesn't know whether it is a dream or reality, he thinks it's a dream, and uh, he kind of wishes his brother was with him so that they could talk about this and laugh. And... He, is, you know, whenever he's speaking, he's not hinting about a water source or leading them to a place or anything. He's not, uh, it looks like he's not aware of what these people want. And he has no intention of helping them or he's not aware that, you know, he could help them. There is no indication in what he is speaking. He's more like a dreamy uh, person and he's, you know, speaking this poetic language. Uh, even though we cannot understand the poetry in this language, in in his language, and also you know, in another sequence, he's talking a lot, and it is about a shaman visiting him and you know, uh, interacting with his own people, and he's kind of narrating a story to himself. Um, maybe because he is in captive, he's a captive, he's in bondage, he's not free, and he used to be free, and so he's kind of trying to escape his own predicament by imagining his past or, you know, thinking about his own relationship with his community. So, you know, the, the idea is this person has a life and circumstance and a language and a culture entirely different from um, the, the, you know, the wagon people, you know, um, all the Meek and um, uh, the, the, the Stephen Meek and the people led by Stephen Meek. Entirely different culture and and entirely different spirit. And the, the two, 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 um, two cultures, even though they go together, well, in the sense, one is a captive and they're trying to make use of him, and but they are not able to make use of him. And, uh, and there is a lot of ugly American history kind of um, packed in the movie. So there is a scene in which uh, they are giving him a blanket so there's a, it's kind of alluding to an old nasty history in, um, in America that the Native American people were given blankets uh, with uh, a smallpox uh, virus in order to kill them. So those Native American people using this blanket with the cowpox virus will get the disease and you know they will die. That's you know the, 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 that's an ugly idea. So giving the blanket kind of mirrors that nasty history, and also when uh, they are giving him the blanket, uh, Stephen Meek says that one way or other we will take it back. Okay, so there is long history of um, the Americans or, or you know the the, the white people um, giving Native Americans lot of stuff in order to make use of them and take it back at you know at a later point so you know there's a lot of ugly history uh, packed into this uh, small movie okay. then uh, again you know uh, form of, uh, if, if you think about the movie in a more formal sense it's uh, it has this uh, narrow academy ratio of 1 to 1.33 and that's because you know Kelly uh, herself said 
uh, that's because uh, the women, uh, the main characters in the movie are wearing a, a headscarf, you know, they, 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 they have a thing um, uh, on their head that's kind of limiting their field of vision. So they, their perspective is very limited. So in order to suggest to that, uh, she decided to go with this, you know, 1.33 aspect ratio. Uh, so because you know, the movie is mostly about these women, the women are the major characters and it's about their vision. And uh, historically, if you think about it, Westerns are known for uh, this, you know, wide screen landscape, you know, covering a lot of area and wide, le uh, you know, wide lenses and, you know, all these um, technical details. But this movie kind of goes in the opposite direction. So, you know, you could say it's a, um, uh, what the exact term I forgot, um, a regenerative, uh, a reformative Western or something. I mean, uh, um, so um, again, that's the idea of mixed cutoff. And uh, finally, these people are reaching. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, revisionist Western. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I lost that word. Yeah. <laughs> revisionist Western. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So at the end of the movie, these people are reaching to a tree, isolated tree in, a, in the middle of a uh, desert. And the tree is kind of half living or half dead, either way, how you look at it. And um, there is no hint that they are reaching their destination. There is no hint that there is water for them. And the movie is kind of ending that moment. So, you know, if you look, go back to the real story, um, a lot of people who started off with Stephen Meek eventually reached the Willamette Valley, you know, their destination, even though a lot of people died on the way. And the, the group kind of splits in between in the way and there is a lot of drama actually. Um, you know, some of the people in the group, uh, he, you know, who recognized that Stephen Meek is kind of leading them off and he has no idea. They tried to kill them, kill Stephen Meek. And uh, Stephen Meek and his wife, who recognizes this plot to kill them, kind of escape. Um, and there's a lot of drama, real drama in the, in the real story. But, uh, you know, when Kelly is adapting the, uh, the real story, she's not going for the drama. I mean, uh, almost any other, you know, filmmaker in Hollywood, in, um, uh, Kelly Reichert is not a Hollywood filmmaker, even though she's American, not Hollywood. But, you know, any, any um, in a studio production of this makes cut off story, will, uh, I'm sure it will go for this, you know, drama in the real story. But uh, Kelly is not going for the drama. Instead, he's trying to um, capture this, you know, this uh, this moment in history where people are, you know, some people are trapped in a in a landscape that that is foreign to them, and they're trying to escape so that they can get to a better place and they can, you know, find opportunities. Uh, and probably build a better life in the new place. And, and the, you know, the, you know uh, uh, like all the, um, uh, her previous work, it is about trying, people trying to escape their predicament or their situation or, or, or their, their, their physical surrounding or their, you know, uh, situation, emotional and life situation. So um, after Meek's cut off, it is Night Moves. Uh, so, uh, that came out in 2013. So Night Moves, uh, that is probably um, most mainstream film by Kelly Raycott. So it features a uh, lot of well-known actors uh, like uh, Jesse Eisenberg and Dakota Fanning and Peter Sarsgaard. Those are the three main people in the story. So uh, these are uh, eco terrorists in some you know eco terrorists in some sense so they're trying to blow up a dam uh, in order to send a message to the you know the the larger world that you know the the, the you know people have to be careful about uh, atmosphere and you know the climate and all the all these so it is eco terrorism these people are these three main characters are eco terrorists and um, it's a, it, it, it's um, short and edited, more like a popular film. Uh, the pacing, especially, 
and um, you know all her previous work has kind of a slow rhythm with the lingering shots uh, not much uh, fast cutting but in night moves um, she kind of plots it like a thriller um, so the, the, there is you know three people coming together and they have a uh, mission to carry out a crime and to commit violence and um, the, the almost the first 30, 40 minutes of the film is their preparation and on the way we learn about, we learn a little bit about them and it is building their, you know, action. It's, um, they're buying a boat and they're uh, trying to acquire fertilizer, N NPK fertilizer, which can be used to build a bomb. So this is the idea. So they're trying to uh, get fake IDs and try to present this fake ID in order to get the fertilizer so that they can make the bomb and transfer, uh, transport uh, the bomb using a boat. And, and it, it's, you know, it's a, uh, if you're watching it for the first time, it's not very obvious what they're trying to do. Uh, so because the movie kind of keeps its, its um, you know, exposition, exposition style uh, more like an art film. So uh, it's even though the pacing and the cutting is more like a Hollywood genre movie, uh, the, the the exposition is more like an art movie. So it does it exactly, you know, a, a genre movie, a genre movie made in Hollywood usually tells us the same information at least three times, uh, so that people can remember and people can connect between these scenes and sequences. But Kelly doesn't do that. And he, she barely gives us information what they're trying to do. And we have to piece together bits of information in order to you know, know their intention. And by the time we learn their intention and motivation, uh, you know, they are already doing it. They, they're blowing up the dam. So in a normal genre movie, you would probably expect the, you know, the crime to be, um, you know, crime to happen more or less in the, last act or somewhere around there in this movie the 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 um the the crime the the even they are focusing on happens somewhere around the middle of the movie and it's not very elaborate but it's a mo in, it's mostly silent because of these settings and it's um, at night they have to um uh, they have to be silent uh, in order not to be caught and uh, they blow up the dam and um, um, but now the situation is, you know, a person dies and they're trying to escape, uh, uh, you know, trying try, try not to be caught and they suspect the girl with them is, uh, is going to talk to the police and, you know, it goes from there. So I, I don't want to go, you know, give out the entire story if you haven't watched it. But anyway, so that's the basic idea of the film. So again, um, if you think about it, the, the, these are three people, they, they think they are, uh, kind of caught up in the wrong place, the wrong world, you know. Uh, it, it, to them, they are okay, but the world is not okay. The world is not caring about climate change. The world is not caring about pollution. So they are fighting the world or they're trying to send a message to the world so that they can, you know, kind of rectify the world or they, they can, you know, uh, rescue the world. That's their idea. Okay, they're, they're trying to reach a better world, you know, in some sense. They're trying to make a better world in some sense, even though their means are not, you know, that's not what, what actually happens. They they fail to attain their, their goal, their primary goal, even though it looks like is to blow up the dam, but their ultimate goal is to make a change, uh, bring a change uh, to the world. But and they miserably fail in their, you know, ultimate goal. They, 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 their immediate goal, they, they um, you know, kind of succeed in their immediate goal of uh, blowing up the dam, but their ultimate goal is to change the world and they miserably fail in that, you know, like um, almost any other Kelly Riker character, they fail in their endeavor to change the world. And, um, you know, it's kind of a political movie if you think about it, but, you know, Kelly is not very obvious uh, when it comes to, um, you know, explaining her um, leniencies or her ideals or anything. Uh, so, so that's a, 
Uh, personally, I think uh, uh, Nightmoves is uh, well. Uh, I don't know. I should say this, but uh, this is the this is the least favorite of mine among her movies. So this plays. Uh, I think there is a lot of um, uneven pacing in the movie. Sometimes it's more lingering shots. Uh, sometimes it's a uh, uh, too much, uh, uh, too fast. Um, and, and I think there is you know kind of uneven, and we don't we don't. Uh, see too much of the characters. We don't see their internal life. Um, I think that's that's what I thought about Night Moves. Then certain women. Uh, so this is the the story is set up in Montana. Um, it's a portmanteau film, an anthological film uh, based on the stories of Miley Malloy. Uh, the three there are three stories, and the three stories are from two collections of Miley Malloy. Uh, three stories and there are some known actors in this uh, movie um, there is a uh, christian stewart uh, playing one of the central characters then uh, laura dern again michelle williams then there is lily gladstone she was not well known at the time but now she is she's playing a major role in killers of the flower moon directed by martin scorsese so she's um, she's a native american actress kind of getting her prominence um, uh, now. So it was, you know, kind of her, you know, early major roles in film. So the first story is set around the character, uh, Laura Wells, played by Laura Dern. So she is uh, this attorney in Montana, in a, in a small town, Montana, and where, you know, people um, go to a, you know, a, an attorney, when their life is in trouble or their experiences, circumstances, those you know that are uh, very much outside of their control, so they don't go to attorneys um, that often. So, if you think from the perspective of the attorney, they are seeing these people all the time. You know, this you know they they they, they are dealing with. Uh, you know, very serious situations in um, every person's their life they are meeting with. So Laura Dern, you know, uh, the, the character, when we uh, first uh, see her, um, it's in a bedroom. Uh, she's in a bedroom and uh, she's getting dressed, um, probably after a uh, sexual relationship uh, with a man who is in the other room, again, uh, getting, um, you know, putting his clothes on after the relationship. They are in two uh, different rooms. It's kind of suggesting, you know, they, they are not in a, uh, in a married relationship or anything. So it kind of brings the idea that she is um, she is more a career focused woman and uh, career focused woman and uh, she is uh, trying to find a, an emotional escape aid with, uh, with, with a man um, whom she may or may not like. Uh, so it's you know it's like a fling. So that is the situation with her. So she is in a situation that she doesn't very much like in, in, in a way, okay, emotionally, or I don't know what's her idea about um, her, you know, her, her own outlook about her career, but in, a, in, in some sense, you know, in, in one of the scenes, uh, she kind of um, talks about, she is not getting the respect uh, she deserves because of her gender. So, and the, the idea is, you know, there is a person, her client, um, who wants to sue his employer uh, for a work-related accident. But she, I mean, for but the person who already received some money from the employer cannot sue, uh, sue him because he already got the got some money. So. She is trying to explain to him that um, there is no legal grounds that he can sue his employer, um, but he doesn't agree with her. And uh, she takes her to another attorney who happens to be a man. And that attorney talks to her client and says the same thing. And she cannot, uh, I'm sorry, uh, he cannot sue because he already received some money from his employer, so he cannot sue. And he says, okay, he understands it. When a man says the same thing and 
and she you know kind of says it la out loud at one um in one scene uh that you know she um kind of wishes if people understood her um just because you know because you know because of her gender people are not believing her or people are not willing to agree with her so you know her life situation she is a woman and there is a problem for her in her professional life she is not getting the respect or agreement she is hoping for um she is as qualified as any other male lawyer but um, she is not getting that respect so that is that problem with uh, with her and uh, she is in this kind of emotional uh, predicament in which um, she is uh, not having a steady relationship or a family so there is that situation and uh, the, the, the that story kind of goes into a um, kind of a donor type uh, situation where you know her client goes and takes a police officer in or or a security officer as a hostage and um, makes up a drama and uh, the police are trying to you know uh, negotiate with him and capture him and they 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 call the attorney Laura uh, to talk to him and and he's holding a guy hostage with a gun and she has to go to the person uh, you know who's you know armed and violent person probably not all right in his mind and she has to go there and talk to this person and convince him to you know give the hostage away and she is not you know very experienced or in you know in in hostage negotiation so the the story goes more like a you know a genre um, there are a lot of genre elements that play in that segment of the story uh then uh, the second story in the movie is uh set around a character called Gina Lewis played by Michelle Williams again um, that's one of the most uh, under understated stories in the entire movie so uh, this character um camping with uh, her husband and her daughter teenage daughter <coughs> and she is not in a very good relationship with either her daughter or her husband she is in this marriage okay but uh, in this part of this family but she is not in a very well relationship with her husband or her uh, or her daughter and um, it's implied uh, in, um, in in implied through dialogue that you know the, it's not very smooth the relationship is not very smooth now um, she you know uh, when they are driving home back home they happen to visit an old guy they you know knew him uh uh from earlier and um, uh that, that this older person has a lot of sandstone in his in his yard and they're building a house you know the michelle williams character and her family they're building a house and um, and the, she thinks she could use these sandstones they are you know lying around without any use the, the person the old guy in the house is you know it's obvious he's not use, going to use them so they go they goes to this old person and ask his permission to you know take these sandstones and they say you know uh, he can sell it to them they will pay for it they don't want it free they will pay for it and uh, uh, the the person is interesting that the old guy is interesting and uh, he doesn't address the woman in any way okay he he's always talking to the man the husband and uh, he's talking about you know he's not directly answering their question but he's Talk, you know, he's he is uh, beating around the bush. You know, one could say he's talking about or the peripheral ideas or the you know long story back uh, when he built the house and there was a schoolhouse and the sandstones are from the schoolhouse and you know, he talks around a lot, but she, uh, you know, he doesn't directly answer their question and he doesn't answer to the woman. He doesn't address the woman, so she kind of understands this you know probably because you know he doesn't like women or i don't i don't know what well, we don't know what is the reason and she feels it that she, even though he she is speaking and she is the one who wants the sandstone but she is not spoken to and the, the old man is deliberately avoiding her and talking to her husband instead okay so there is this gender idea again uh then uh, again and the uh, last part of that story they 
take the sandstone with them. And while taking the sandstone, the older girl, person is looking through the window and she waves at him, but he doesn't respond. And it's, it's you know, kind of demeaning in a way. And uh, uh, it, it's a very hard to describe the story or it's very hard to describe what this story segment is about. Uh, maybe you could say it is about, um, you know, it's about conquering something. Uh, well, a person has uh, this sandstone, uh, which is of no use to him, and which is lying around for more than 30 years. And a woman is coming and taking his stuff. You know, the, the, the entire American West, the history of American West is about conquering the region. So the, the region belonged to someone else. And the, uh, the outsider people are going there and taking control of the region, right? It's kind of mirroring in a way, but here the woman is taking control of uh, the, the, the property, the material. And um, the man, he is not willing to respond or willing to give it, uh, you know. Um, so there is that, the, the, the historical idea of conquering built into the story. And also there is this idea of gender construct and also, it is also about asking a person uh, to give them something he cannot use. So indirectly suggesting, I can make use of, I can make a better use of your things than you can. So, so indirectly, that is what is happening. She is telling to the man that I can make a better use of your stuff than you can. Okay? And uh, he kind of understands it. And after that, she kind of feels sorry. I mean, she, she kind of, you know, she kind of feels sorry about what she said. Uh, when she, when they are uh, driving back, uh, she talks to her husband whether it was appropriate, uh, whether it was okay to ask for the sandstones. So, um, you know, that, that's the basic idea of the story. It's very understated. And um, uh, the third story in that movie is uh, played about uh, played around two characters. Uh, one is uh, Elizabeth Travis or Beth Travis, again an attorney, uh, a young attorney just out of uh, law school, uh, played by Kristen Stewart, and Lily Gladstone, uh, who is a rancher, who, who takes care of horses. Okay, so again in this movie there is a human animal relationship. Um, there is a dog along with Michelle Williams, and uh, there is uh, there is this horse taken care of by Lady um, uh, Gladstone, the, the ranger. Uh, the character name is Jamie. So um, the idea is uh, Krista Stewart character, who is right out of uh, law school, find, uh, want to find a job. She is from this middle class family. Uh, she talks about it in one scene. Um, her, her family members, none of them had a white collar job. All of them are blue collar workers and, and this is the best job, you know, someone from their background who could ever think of. So she takes up an instructor job in a community schooling or, you know, some kind of situation, community education or something. And she, is, she has to, she didn't know about the place and she has to drive four hours in one direction. So Montana is a very big state. You could start driving in the morning and still, you know, at the end of the day, you, you will still be in the same state. It's a very big state. I lived there for one year. I'm kind of familiar with a lot of locations in the movie. Um, so I, I, you know, by map, I know I have, I have been to some of the places in the movie. So I know the landscape. Um, well, um, I lived there one year, so. Um, familiar with the landscape. So the, uh, this is a vast um, area and a small time, uh, small towns separated by large distances. So the Christian Stewart character, she takes up a job in a, in a place that's four hours away and she doesn't recognize it's four hours away. So she has to, she has two jobs. She has to drive four hours one way to take a class and uh, drive back the night so she's, you know, uh, doing this community job and not obviously not pay, uh, getting paid much for this job. 
and um, she meets a person called uh, Jamie there, played by Lily Gladstone. She is not supposed to go to the class, but goes there anyway. And um, um, she she is not supposed to take the class, but it looks like uh, Jamie, the Lily Gladstone character, saw Krista Stewart and uh, she liked Krista Stewart's character. That's why she's going in. And in the le uh, real story, uh, the, range, uh, the ranger is played by a man. I'm sorry, uh, uh, in the real story, it's a man uh, called uh, Chet. His name is Chet. So uh, in the movie, it is changed to, changed to Jamie instead of Chet the man is a Jamie, a woman. So that's a, you know, that's the change Kelly Raycott made and the director didn't know about it. Uh, the director knew about the story change when uh, she was watching the movie for the first time and she was kind of surprised because it's, it, uh, it brings forth a lot of ideas in the story in a more obvious way. So she was not expecting this. Uh, I, I, I watched a uh, video interview uh, by uh, Miley Mello, who wrote the story, and she was kind of she says she was kind of surprised by this uh, gender change of the main character. So instead of a man uh, falling in love with a woman, it's more like a woman falling in love with a woman. Uh, um, you, you, you can kind of uh, see that uh, the the the, the, the one-sided romance is very understated. Uh, so whenever the class is going on. Um, I think uh, three or four times the movie comes back to the class setting and each time we see the class from uh, the perspective of the Jamie's character, uh, the, the, the character Jamie, Lily Gladstone's character. We see the room, the classroom from her perspective and um, in, you know, each uh, subsequent scene set in the classroom, uh, we see uh, other students coming into the classroom after Jamie. So, you know, she's getting there earlier and earlier and earlier, you know, as time goes on, she's getting there earlier uh, in anticipation of uh, meeting Elizabeth or, you know, the Christian Stewart character. And uh, when Elizabeth uh, enters the room, her eyes light up. We can see um, um, her uh, pupils dilate and um, it's uh, it's kind of obvious that she is falling in love with the uh, with the, the Christian Stewart character, but uh, the Christian Stewart character doesn't recognize it. Okay? And uh, after the class, they go to a diner, and um, they, they order. I mean, um, Beth is eating. Beth, the Christian Stewart character, so Elizabeth. So Beth is eating. Uh, she orders a burger, eats half of it, and offers the other half to Jamie but uh, Jamie refused the food. She doesn't take the food, even though she's hungry, okay? We know he, she's hungry because followed by that scene, Beth goes away, Beth drives to the other, um, um, the other city uh, at night, and um, uh, Jamie is going to her own uh, ranch, and um, she is eating a, you know, packaged burger, in, like, a, you know, a, like a one dollar burger, very cheap burger that you can buy uh, from a gas station or someplace. So she is obviously uh, not having much money and she's hungry. And um, even though she's hungry, she's not offering food offered by um, the Christian Stewart character, who is a lawyer, okay, who's right out the jo a lawyer and uh, has this movie star charisma with her. So she's um, you know, the, 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 you know, Christian Stewart has this movie star charisma with her, with her appearance. And that appearance is kind of used in the movie in, in an interesting way. And it, uh, even though Christian Stewart um, is the well-known character, but the story is not around the, her character. The story is more about, around Jamie, played by Gl uh, Lily Gladstone. And uh, well, it's, um, it's kind of understated romance in the movie. Then after that, after that movie, let's go into the recent movie, First Cow. So uh, again, um, that is based on a novel written by John Raymond, who also wrote the story behind Old Joy and uh, I think uh, Night Moves. 
Um, she, uh, he is a frequent collaborator uh, for Kelly Raycard. So um, it's a uh, the, the first cow uh, movie is based on a novel called Half Life, and that story uh, revolves around two time periods. And uh, but um, the movie focuses more on uh, one of the time periods, which is set in um, around 1821, again in Oregon. That's the frontier place at that time. So the movie starts with um, a traveling group of uh, fur trappers. So they kill beaver and take the fur and uh, trade the fur. And that's the, that was the idea. Uh, so it was, you know, long before you could imagine any Western movie setting. So it was long before the frontier men were there and there are no uh, white women in the entire movie because there were no white women in the Western frontier at that time. And uh, it's actually a very diverse crowd of characters. So the main character is uh, uh, Cookie uh, Figurovitz. That's the name. Cookie is, you know, that's what people call him because he's a cook, uh, you know, he's a cook. Uh, so he's called Cookie. And he's traveling with uh, uh, a group of fur trappers. And they happen to meet a Chinese, peop uh, a Chinese man. Uh, King Hu, I think his name is King Hu. Yeah. And um, well, that is the main story idea. Okay, that's the main story is set around. But even before that, there is a small segment, maybe like 10 minutes. There's a small segment uh, where, the, where, the, where, where it is set uh, somewhere in the modern time period. Probably, a, you know, the current time period uh, where a girl is walking around with her dog Again, the human-animal connection there. Maybe you could think of it as Wendy and Lucy, but uh, this time it's not Wendy, when it's a, a played by Alia Shaik, uh, Shaukat and a, and a dog. And they're walking around and the dog sniffs around, you know, in the ground. And in the background, we see a ship. We see, uh, we hear the whistles of a, of a train. And we hear, uh, sound from an aeroplane. So, you know, there is, uh, also we see some uh, smoke probably from a factory or someplace and, you know, it's hinting this industrialized uh, Western, um, you know, city or, you know, suburban landscape or someplace, right? So it's not clear where it is, but it's obvious it is present, I uh, mean, it is present day that the, the that beginning sequences are set in. So this woman um, walking around with her dog and dog is sniffing around the ground and, and, and she uh, happens to spot a skull there. So, so she digs around the skull and finds two bodies, uh, two, two skeletons lying side by side. So we, you know, we see a static shot of the two, skull, uh, two skeletons lying there. And there, there's an interesting edit it goes to 200 years back in uh, 1831 and where a guy is plucking mushrooms, uh, picking mushrooms, uh, that is Cookie, figure of it. And you know, Cookie is traveling with uh, some fur trappers and he's, you know, trying to reach a place where they could find a better life like in any other Kelly Ray card characters. And, um, uh, uh, they, they, uh, you know, Cookie happens to meet this um, China man. He is being traced by, or he is being chased by Russians, who want to kill him because he killed someone in their group. Uh, for you know, there, 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 there is a backstory with this Chinese person, and uh, we kind of get the idea he's not a violent person or anything, but you know, he happens to have done this crime and he's being chased for that crime he did or that act of violence. And um, he's being uh, chased and he's trying to escape. So Cookie helps him, uh, Cookie hides him and gives him food. And when they reach the, their destination, you know, the fur trappers go away, you know, they are, you know, c continuously traveling. So Cookie stays behind with this Chinese person and um, the Chinese person takes a cookie to his house 
which is kind of a makeshift arrangement you know um, the, the, the it's, it, it's built from some wood and very crudely built structure and he's living in there as soon as they reach in that house cookie takes charge of this uh, you know the area the house and he starts cleaning the house you know kind of taking place the uh, taking the place of a wife or you know um, in, you know in that in that cultural uh, landscape what do you expect for, for a woman to do that's what cookie is doing so these two uh, men they strike up a very domestic relationship uh, there is no hint of sexuality or anything they they you know they immediately uh, fall in a friendship so you know in a way it kind of reminds about old joy which is again about the friendship between two men so old joy in a way was about the end of a friendship but first cow is more about the beginning of a friendship right now these two men uh, they see a you know a cow is being brought to the place by a, um, a chief factor um, i mean we don't know what that is probably uh, the local governor or something which is uh, you know who is played by toby james british actor very interesting actor so uh, you know the, uh, he is you know the local governor and um, he's probably rich and he's uh, bringing a cow it's actually a family of a cow um, it's a thoroughbred uh, you know a kind of uh, uh, some you know cow with some pedigree i mean it's uh, from normandy or you know france and it's being brought over to this place because you know it's a good cow uh, but on the way um, the ox dies on the way and also the calf dies on the way and it's just the cow that reaches the destination so it's just the cow and um, the cow is kind of the female lead in the movie okay there is no heroine the heroine is the cow okay and also the title character right and um, so we see a kind a kind of a you know triangular uh, relationship between cookie and the, the chinese person and the cow so they what they do is they're milking the cow at night uh, to make um, you know the prototype of a donut or something they call it oily cake so cookie is a cook right so he knows how to uh, bake stuff so there is a back story for cookie so from the, his name figure of it he's a jew and jews were discriminated against that time so he grew up in maryland but but he doesn't have much um, family or anything uh, he happened to be in boston for some reason and um, he learned cooking or baking um, uh, while working for a baker in boston now, there is this back story and probably situations were not very nice probably because of his you know jewish background and that's why he is going to the new place okay and he's hoping probably in a new you know the, the wild west is kind of a new place there is you know no, probably not discrimination probably uh, he will not be discriminated against and um, that's why he's going to a new place okay so he is in this new place now but that's not his final destination either so he want to go to a more warmer place okay you know oregon is to the north and it's cold in winter so he want to go to a warmer place probably california or some place and makes you know want to build a restaurant and you know that's his you know ultimate goal that's his ambition and um, these two people you know the the chinese person and uh, um, this cook Okay, they, they strike up a relationship and they're stealing the cow milk at night and making this oily cake and selling it to people. Um, so there, there is this elaborate sequences where they go at night and um, um, the, 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 the Kiho, the Chinese person who gets onto the top of a tree and, um, you know, kind of signals if anybody comes. He makes the sound of an owl. Okay, so so there is you know there is the human animal relationship uh with the dog and the woman in the beginning then the cow and these two people and uh, then uh, there is a whole bunch of other domestic animals you know a bunch of ducks are shown often 
then uh, there's a cat that is leading to the capture of these men later on. And, and these sequences where they steal the milk it's kind of like a heist movie. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very small movie if you think about it. It's not a genre movie. Uh, but the suspense it builds, it was like a heist movie. It was like, a, uh, like watching a you know, multi-million dollar budgeted heist movie. And it, the, the suspense is that equivalent. Okay? And, uh, um, you know... Um, the, 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 there is again, um, there, the, you know, there is a sequence where they make um, a souffle for, you know, a, a baked um, food for the chief actor played by Toby Jones. And um, um, they are taking, you know, these two people are taking the food to his house where there is a, a Native American man and his, probably his daughter. And uh, the daughter is the translator. The Native American man speaks only that language. And uh, they're talking to the chief actor. And, and there are elaborate sequences of this Native American man speaking in his language. And there is no, you know, there is no subtitles. We don't know what he's speaking because the other people in the room doesn't know what he's speaking, right? So his daughter is translating, you know, whatever this person says in more or less three or four words. You know, we know, we know, obviously he was talking for a minute and he was saying a lot more than three or four words, but this, you know, his daughter is translating it into uh, three or four words. You know, there is this, you know, missing cultures, uh, kind of lost in translation. Okay, that's the, that is the idea again there, you know, like in mixed cutoff. Okay. Then, uh, yeah, it, it goes to, you know the the idea is about you know the, the story begins with uh, with a time and place somewhere in the in the in the current time period and in some western capitalist industrialized society that's when the uh, the, the the girl and the dog is finding the two skeletons and we are going to going back to 200 years when this capitalist society is in the making. There is no fixed currency there, there because you know the dollar was not established at that time. So people give whatever they you know have you know sometimes a button, sometimes the kind some kind of coins. So you know this this you know there is there, there is this economic transaction but there is no fixed currency. So everything is in the making in the movie, you know, the, the capitalist system, what is, what is going to be. And that capitalist system is built more or less according to the whims of uh, these people, you know, kind of like the, uh, the, 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 the chief factor played by Toby Jones. So in a, in, a, in a scene, there is a dialogue where Toby Jones is speaking to, you know, another colleague of him when, um, you know, he says, Sometimes it is uh, justifiable to uh, kill a person, uh, kill a worker, in order to give a lesson to the other workers. And you know, sometimes it is, you know, profitable to kill a worker in order to give a message, give a message to the, you know, other workers. You know, that's kind of cruel and nasty, um, you know, outlook about the world. And those people are building the society. Okay. And uh, uh, these two people, you know, the, the you know the cook and the Chinese person, they are building, they are striking a relationship, and uh, they are uh, building a life. They actually make pretty much a fortune. They, they talk about it, uh, selling oily cakes. Okay, uh, but you know, if you think about it, stealing milk is not that a big crime. Okay, it's, it's stealing milk. Right, it's not a big crime, but uh, uh, these people are punished for the seemingly not so important crime, and that's the tragedy of it. And that's the that's the uh, that's the you know the underlying fabric of the American capitalist society. So. Um, yeah, um, so, um, you know, going back to all of 
the feelings by Kelly Raycott. Um, we kind of talked about uh, most of her filmography now, except for the uh, short films. And uh, the, the common thread I see is that uh, she's building these narratives about people who are intricately connected to their surroundings, their, their physical location, you know, their, geog their geographical placement, and also the time period they are set in, and also uh, their immediate life circumstances. You know, so, so these people are kind of trapped in their life, you know, which includes their, you know, their, their, their economic situation they are in. Uh, you know, if Wendy and Lucy, Wendy needs money to go to Alaska. In Fuscow, these two people want money to go to California and make a better life. And sometimes it's a financial, sometimes it's more emotional. And anyway, they are kind of trapped in this, you know, situation, in their life situations, which they are trying to escape. And um, they often, uh, you know, almost always they are failing to, um, you know, they're failing to escape their situation. They're, you know, they, you know, it's about uh, uh, failed characters um, or failed people trying to escape their situation. Uh, so that's the common thread I find in, um, you know, all of her work. And um, uh, um, if you, um, I mean, if you haven't wa tried watching any of her movies, I would say, you know, start with. Um, uh, start with uh, I don't know where to start. That's, uh, that's I, I I started with Old Joy. I didn't like it at the when I watched it first because it was too slow and there was nothing much happening and two people talking and it didn't communicate with me at the time. Uh, but um, you know I have this you know tendency to go back to a film I don't like often. So I uh, um, rewatched it a um, couple of years later and you know. Uh, I liked it for the second viewing, on the second viewing. Uh, Wendy and Lucy is kind of a good point to begin uh, because there is an emotional trajectory there. Uh, there's a, uh, the, 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 there's an emotional trajectory for the ca character. And I think uh, First Cow and Meek's Cutoff are my favorite works uh, among these films. And also Certain Woman. Certain Woman I really like in the first, uh, my first viewing. But I rewatched it, and um, you know, uh, I, you know, I, prof I you know, I, it's a, it's profound, understated nature. Um, you know, it failed to reach me in the first viewing, but in the second viewing, I, uh, I liked it uh, much more than uh, I thought. Uh, so, uh, so, first cow, certain women, and meek's cut off are probably my favorite, and old joy and Wendy and Lucy that kind of follows. And Night Moves is probably, I think, uh, one of the one of her movies that uh, I'm not not I don't have too strong opinion about. Even though it plays more like a genre movie or you know more, more you know. But um, you know, so yeah, that's a that is what I want to say right now. Uh, probably in a, in a uh, you know in um, uh, if I think more about it, you know, there are a lot of things coming into my mind. But you know, we have to stop at some point. <laughs> All right, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Robbie, for being this true. Uh,